I just want to introduce now um, to you Ellen Freed and Steve Barnett, uh, they're, um, as well as Linda Lowther giving us the keynote uh, talks today. Um, so Ellen's uh, background is in, we're delighted to have them. I must say we had a, a, a round table yesterday and it was so helpful and, and so help uh, in discussing the issues around implementation of, um, of full day learning. So I'm very excited to have them here. Ellen's background is in education and developmental psychology. She worked as a teacher. Um, and in early childhood programs for a number of years before doing her PhD, including uh, Head Start, so she comes from a Head Start background. She's the co-director with Steve of the National Institute for Early Education Research, and she's a research professor at Rutgers. She's written widely on the effects on, of preschool, on language and literacy, on math and science learning, on measurement development and classroom assessment. Um, she's advising the government on, on their preschool work. Uh, Steve is an economist by background. He is uh, the co-director with Ellen of the National Institute for Early Education Research. He is a professor of economics and policy at Rutgers University. He's also involved in the evaluation of policies for young children. He's been doing that the whole of his career, including the Perry Preschool Program. He set it up many of the preschool evaluation projects in the US. So for me, what's so impressive about both Ellen and Steve are they are top-notch scientists who generate high-quality data on which to build policy and then disseminate this to government. And they are models for what we're trying to do at the Atkinson Center. So please welcome them. So Ellen and I have divided up the, the talk this morning. I, I'm going to start with the big picture and work my way down a little. And then Ellen is going to talk much more about uh, the specifics, what it really means in concrete terms for policy and practice, and our research on evidence-based practice in our state of New Jersey over the last decade. Um, just to, to give you a sense of where I'm coming from, I want to start with a story. Um, a shepherd's out with his flock, and it's, it's a really big flock of sheep, and he sees in the distance a stranger coming over the horizon. And um, stranger looks around, he sees this huge flock of sheep, and he sees an opportunity. So he walks up to the shepherd, and he says, tell you what, <clears throat> I'll bet you one of your animals, I can tell you exactly how many are in your flock. The shepherd thinks about it. He's never seen this person before. It's clearly a stranger. His flock is huge. He thinks, there's no way. So he says, okay, it's a deal. The stranger says, 3,472. He's shocked that the shepherd doesn't know what to think. He says, well, that's exactly right. So go ahead, pick up, you know, it was a deal's a deal. Pick, up, pick any animal you want and the stranger looks around, picks one up, and starts to walk away. And, and the, um, the shepherd says, wait, I'll bet you twice the value of one of my sheep that I can tell you what your occupation is. And the stranger's thinking the same thoughts as the shepherd. Well, he's, I'm, I've never been here before. He has no idea who I am. And he says, great, I'm going to you know, double the bet here. Sure. And the shepherd says, you're an economist. Well, he's shocked. How did you know that, he says. And the shepherd says, well, first put down my dog. <laughs> so we're very good at some things, not so good at others. Um, and I'm going to stick to the ones that I'm better at. Um, so if you're interested in making evidence-based policy, there are two ways to do this, the right way and the way it's usually done. The way it's usually done is to start with my policy and then find some evidence that supports it. And the nature of research is there is always evidence that will support whatever policy you want to endorse. 
Right? So if you start that way, you're in trouble. If you start from the perspective of, well, not what do the studies that I like say, what does all of the research say? Now you're in a, a different game. Right? One where evidence, I think, really can direct policy in a useful way. And so we've done a meta-analysis. A meta-analysis is basically just a statistical summary of the research, looking at all of the studies done since 1960 on early intervention, early education, any program that had education in it for children under five. Right? So um, it, it's actually not as big a set of studies. It's 123 different studies. Now, many of those, like the Perry Preschool, has probably hundreds of publications. But in some sense, it's one study. Um, and if you summarize those, and you want to summarize across lots of different measures, you have to put it into some kind of, of common metric, which we call an effect size. And that's, to give you some sense, an effect size of one is basically the size of the achievement gap in the United States between middle-income kids and poor kids, between black kids and white kids. All right, so if we could have a permanent effect of one on this metric, we could close the achievement gap. That would be a big deal. So across all of these studies, if we look at the initial effects, the initial effect is about half of standard deviation. So that across all of these studies, they begin, the effects are big enough to close about half the achievement gap. Now, if we move a little further along and we say, well, what happens after school entry? You'll notice it's a lot smaller. Right? Now we're down to about 15% of the achievement gap. And the estimate beyond age 10 is a little bigger. Those aren't necessarily the same studies, by the way, right? because every study doesn't follow kids beyond age 10. And lar higher quality studies have larger effects. If we look at social and emotional behavior, schooling impacts, they don't, they don't get smaller over time, but, but they are, by their nature, later measures to begin with, right? And so they're much more like the later measures of IQ achievement and language. To try to unravel this a little bit and see a little bit more about what it means, study quality has a big impact on effect size. So it turns out that higher quality studies find larger effects. That's important because if we now adjust for study quality and say, well, what if we only looked at high quality research? How big would effect sizes be? So the initial effect there is about 70% of, of an, an effect size of one, uh, about half that later on. And if we look at more optimal programs, so that I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means, but basically if the program studied had the characteristics of the ones that were more effective. Now how big an effect could we have? And for policy purposes, I think that's really where we ought to think about our goals. So almost the entire achievement gap could be closed by these programs. And these are mostly studies of impacts on disadvantaged kids. And long term, about half the achievement gap. Right. So that says early intervention programs birth to five with an educational component have the potential to close about half the achievement gap permanently. Not just based on one study I happen to like or a couple of studies, but looking across the whole research literature over decades. Now, what are the things that we found that matter, a little more specifically. Well, time of follow-up clearly is negative. So you hear a lot about, well, the, pro the effects don't last, they fade out. So it's important to understand that's a half-truth. Effects are smaller in the long term than they are immediately. Right? Partly that's because we have school systems that are working very hard after children enter them to compensate the kids who are at the bottom. So part of this is catch up, not fade out. But it's also true that effects are smaller in the long run than they are immediately. So if we want to have big long-term effects, 
we have to have really, really big short-term effects. Right? So I think the policy lesson for that is small immediate effects of programs hoping to have big long-term impacts, that's not going to happen. We want to have big long-term impacts. We have to have really, really effective programs that have very strong impacts to begin with. Second, intentional teaching. Back in 1960, 1970, that would have been called direct instruction. Right? So intentional teaching includes direct instruction. It is not only direct instruction. Ellen Friedi is going to talk more about exactly what we mean by that. Also individualization. Right? So more intentional teaching, more individualization of that, an individu of that intentional teaching. So these are interactive. What do I mean by in, in individualization? Very specifically, one-on-one -on -one interactions with the teacher and work in small groups. The programs that had those and did intentional teaching in that context, not whole group instruction, right, had much larger impacts. Comprehensive services had negative impacts on program outcomes. Now that's going to seem counterintuitive and counter to what you just heard. Right? So meta-analysis isn't particularly good at helping us understand why we find this. It's just summarizing what we find across the research. And I think one clear possibility is programs that are asked to do too much with their budgets don't do very well. Right? So if you ask programs to do a lot and you don't give them enough resources to do that, they're not very effective. I think there are also questions about focus right? and how tightly focused the program is. And the fact that a single program may not be effective at delivering comprehensive services doesn't mean that you shouldn't have policies where multiple programs deliver comprehensive services. Right? So that's a different issue than what a single program does. And finally, I already talked about design quality. Right? This, sometimes people seem to think if we had strong research, right, then things wouldn't look so good. It's actually the opposite of that. I think that's important to understand. When we do poor quality research, we actually most of the time underestimate the impacts of our programs. To be more concrete, what are we talking about in real terms? I'm talking about animals, right? Are we talking dogs or sheep here? Right? When I'm talking about effect sizes, to make this more real, what we're talking about long term are increases in achievement test scores, decreases in the need for special education and grade repetition, increased high school graduation, decreases in behavior problems, delinquency and crime, improved employment, increased earnings, decreased welfare dependency, decreases in, decreases in, in problem behavior like smoking and drug use, improvements in mental health like reductions in depression. It's important to understand now, I'm talking about a whole body of research. These are findings not just from North America, but globally. From All of these have been replicated in multiple studies. It's not just one study that finds these things. And if you're thinking about these as early childhood development investments, right, all of those things are important for us as a society. They're also important in terms of the problems that governments throughout the world face. Right? So most governments now are dealing with resource constraints, looking toward futures where they're trying to figure out how do we pay for all these programs. They have rising schooling costs, rising social services costs, rising crime costs, rising costs for health for health care. Right? Well, these are all problems that early childhood development programs address. So if you're thinking about this from an economic perspective, which I do, and you're talking to public policymakers, these are programs that address the very real problems that they're trying to deal with. If they're thinking about where do I get money to deal with, how do I reduce the, how do I meet my future obligations, cutting early childhood programs is not the place to begin. Instead, they ought to be thinking about investing in them to reduce these problems in the long run. 
Right? So my job is, much of my job as an economist has been to try to put dollar values on those things. Um, and one of the remarkable things is that when you do that, the costs are, tend to be higher than people think. Right? The Perry Preschool program is a half-day program, but with one teacher for basically every six children. It's very expensive, right? about $18,000 per child. Now, that's multiple years. Um, the Abbasidarian program is a birth-to-five year-round child care program delivering education. You can see that's also very expensive. And the Chicago Child Parent Centers, now that's a half-day program run by the public schools, much less expensive. But in all of these cases, the benefits are much, a benefit cost test basically says, once you take everything into account, do you do better than break even? None of these are even close to break even, and the two preschool programs are, are close, you know, are in the neighborhood of an order of magnitude larger. We could have made lots of mistakes, and even if they were all biased in one direction, you'd still come to the conclusion these are programs that pay for them, more than pay for themselves. Right? So they're very sound investments. To, to give you some sense, again, a little more specifically of what this means, the Chicago Child Parent Centers are very similar, and these, are, these were run over several decades, so most of this data, the problem with doing longitudinal studies is you're not likely to have one you did yesterday if you want a 20-year follow-up. Um, so they tend to be older, but the design of the program and its characteristics are very similar to a lot of the better preschool programs that states fund in the U.S. today. And so if we want to know how big are the impacts of the kinds of programs that we're operating now, Chicago Child Parent Centers provide a much better basis for getting at that than, say, the Perry Preschool with its one teacher for every six kids. Right, here you've got a class size of 18, one teacher and an assistant. Right, that's much more like what we commonly do. So if we look at these effect sizes again, immediate impacts at kindergarten, one year is closing depending on the measure, and that measure of general cognitivity I really don't like. I think it probably was something pretty simple. It turns out that you get big effect sizes on the things that are easy to teach. So if you're trying to teach letter knowledge, for example, there's only 26 of them. It's really easy. <laughs> no time at all. Now, if you're trying to teach vocabulary, it's, there's a lot of words. It's, right, you're gonna, so it's easy to get big effect sizes on letter knowledge. It's hard to get big effect sizes on vocabulary. Math is somewhere in the middle. Um, and so the measure of reading readiness here probably had more to do with vocabulary than it did with letter knowledge. Um, but, you, you know, we're closing a good chunk of the achievement gap with one year, a lot more, basically twice as much with two years. And if we go on to second grade, you can see effects are a little smaller, but not so much smaller, right? Um, and so, by second grade, if you remember the, the meta-analysis data, you don't actually get a lot smaller later on than that. Right? So this is showing this program ha really had the potential to close 20 to 30 percent of the achievement gap with one year, 40, uh, closing on 50 percent with two years. That's a big deal. Right? What other impacts did it have? Well, one year decreased grade repetition by six percentage points, two years by 11 percentage points. These effects are very similar to the ones you're going to see from New Jersey that Ellen's going to talk about. I want to talk a little bit more about what we see across our country in terms of differences in impacts. So I have different kinds of studies here. So a randomized trial from Tennessee on their state pre-K is the first one. Regression discontinuity design, which is sort of the best we can do if we can't do a randomized trial in Tennessee. Eight states on which the, our institute has done um, a regression discontinuity design study, and then randomized trial results from Head Start. Why do I show you all those things? Well, some people say maybe you're getting these different results because you're doing the regression discontinuity design and it's not as good as the randomized trial. That's why I want to show you what happens in Tennessee when you do both of them. 
And so the cognitive language measure is, is a, depending on your perspective, is an IQ measure or a vocabulary measure. It's very general, very broad. Head Start in one year closes about 10% of the gap with that. That's the immediate impact. So think about what I just told you you could expect for long-term impacts as a result of that. Across eight states with pretty good programs, these are not necessarily average programs, these are better ones, um, closing about a quarter of the gap on that. We don't have those kinds of measures in the study in Tennessee, but if we move on to mathematics and letter recognition, print, you know, understanding print, sound, letter, correspondence, and um, much larger effect sizes. But you can see, again, um, these state programs have considerably larger impacts than Head Start. Well, again, go back to the meta-analysis res meta results. These state pre-K programs are much more focused on delivering high-quality services in the classrooms with well-educated, highly paid teachers. Well, highly paid is probably an exaggeration. Highly paid for the early childhood field, which means they're making about double what teachers are making in Head Start. Right? Head Start has a philosophy that much more emphasizes hiring from the community. Teachers don't need to have degrees of any sort. They're paid about $20,000 a year, maybe a little more than that on average, compared to public school teachers that would be making more like 40. Um, and they emphasize providing a wide range of comprehensive services for children and families. I, this, these are the kinds of results are exactly what we would have expected looking at the meta-analysis. But when we think about what do they mean, mean in real terms, this Head Start program is the one the federal government is providing to about a million kids a year. Right? These state programs serve the better state programs serve relatively few children and receive virtually no federal help. To try to unpack this a little more, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma is an interesting place because Oklahoma is essentially the only state in the U.S. where school starts at four. Um, so they have universal preschool education um, in programs that are very, very similar and almost identical in cost to the Chicago Child Parent Centers. And so TPS is Tulsa Public Schools, and those are the effect sizes for math, letter, word, knowledge, and, and a, they call it a spelling test. It's not really spelling for preschoolers or kindergartners. Um, and then THS is Tulsa Head Start. What makes Tulsa Head Start different? Tulsa Head Start is part of universal pre-K, so it's just like Head Start except that it has public school teachers making public school salaries in those classrooms. Their effects are much larger than the effects of Head Start nationally. All we've really varied is the teacher and the teacher pay. Right? So the comprehensive services don't seem to depress their performance, right? which is not what we would expect after all, but changing the teacher does. Now, they're virtually the same on math. They seem to produce smaller effect sizes on um, literacy outcomes. Well, there's one other difference that I didn't mention. Head Start in Tulsa is still limited to just children in poverty. Tulsa Public Schools is for everybody. I think there's a strong, we have to really strongly consider that those literacy differences may be the added value of having higher, higher income peers in your classroom. It's not just for poor kids. And children do learn from each other, perhaps more than we would have thought, at least in literacy, right? I'm not sure I'd expect them to, under, to learn math from each other, which is why we don't see any difference there. Right. I want to talk a little bit about birth to three programs in the United States. Early Head Start produces very modest gains, about the same as Head Start for infants and toddlers despite spending a lot of money in delivering services birth to three. These gains don't last to kindergarten and, and fifth grade follow-up. We found no long-term effects. I don't think that's surprising given our initial Im modest impacts. Nursed Family Partnership is a different kind of program, working through home visits. They produce 
small gains, but these gains appear to be lasting. Um, it's important to understand that they also seem to be for high need groups, right? So mothers who have low psycho, what they call low psychological resources, um, economically disadvantaged families, not for the general population, which is somewhat different from our evidence for preschool, by the way, which is that while effects are larger for disadvantaged children, they're substantial for all the kids. So I think in the birth to three realm, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's the best policy and practice and where we ought to be going. And we really don't have that nailed down. And our approach to policy ought to be a lot more experimental, at least in the states, than it is now given the programs we have. Good morning. I thought about standing up here and being the Vanna White, you know, but I decided I'd just wait till he was finished and then come up. And uh, good job, Steve. You gave me two extra minutes. Um, so what I what I want to present about is is um, what what is what what's inside those programs that are effective that we know across the research, and then specifically talk about the program in New Jersey. Um, because I, I, I helped administer the program and design the program, but we've also been doing research on it. And I think by looking inside of this one program, there's some lessons to be learned in building a program elsewhere. At least I hope that you find that to be true. Otherwise, I just hope I'm entertaining. Um, but uh, the, some of the things that, it, looking across all a wide body of research, getting inside of the programs themselves, really reading about what was offered, um, we, we, we find some, some specific things that seem to be pretty important for a program to be effective. And um, it kind of start, stands to reason, but the program has to be well designed with clear goals and with standards. I mean, the, the standards phrase, I don't know where I started doing air quotes. I didn't used to do that, but anyway. The standards phrase is, um, is kind of new to the scene, but it was, it's been long in existence. Um, you know, those programs Steve talked about, the Chicago parent um, study, parent-child uh, center study uh, program and Perry and Abyssidarian, they had high program standards and high standards for what happened in the classroom, and they had a well-defined program. Um, but that was true across all of the effective programs. It, across, across the body of literature, a balanced approach where we are looking not just at academic skills, but at social skills and also at those underlying thinking and reasoning skills that go with, I mean, I think of academic more broadly, but we're not just talking here about, about letter names or about counting um, in a rote way. Um, what's really kind of important is that it actually gets implemented as it was designed. Um, it, so often in, uh, in, in research, it, things just get labeled, this is preschool, or this is, um, uh, this is, the high scope curriculum, or but then no one goes inside and actually looks to see if it's being implemented as intended, and then you don't get the results that you wanted. Well, the problem is if you do a little bait and switch, if you call, if you sell it on Perry results, and then give what is basically um, a, a childcare program without an educational focus, you're not going to get those Perry results. Um, so it has to be implemented as it was designed, and there has to be checked to see if it was implemented as designed across all of the effective programs, the teachers are, are, were well qualified and they were adequately trained and they had sustained training and they were well paid. Well, again, as Steve said, well paid relative to others in early education. But that's not enough. I mean, one of the, there's a movement out of, um, Ber out of the, the center at Berkeley that Marcy Whitebook runs called um, No Single Ingredient. And we, one of the problems sometimes with advocating for something like well-educated teachers who are well-paid is that people think that's the silver bullet and, and that it's not a single ingredient and we also have to have strong supervision and monitoring. And by monitoring, I mean program improvement monitoring, not gotcha monitoring, but ways in which to help people um, improve cons consistently with, um, in, the, in the program. And we don't pay enough attention to leaders and to leadership. And we don't set standards in early education often enough about who the leaders should be and what qualifications they should have. 
Um, we also uh, see uh, that some connection with the public schools and articulation with K-3 is important. Um, it's, it's not, it's not, you can still do a good job without it, but it seems to be a pretty important indicator of, of, long, of having lasting effects. Um, and then of course, we want children to go into environments that are also helpful to them. And so reforming the, the early education writ large um, is important too, up, to, up through at least third grade. So I wanted to talk a little bit about intentional teaching or explicit instruction or what you, or what is sometimes called direct instruction, but I think that limits what we think about. Um, because I, I'm afraid that when you hear Steve's results of the meta-analysis, you get this, this alarming idea in your head and you just want to not listen to what he says because that's what I do when I hear direct instruction was, the most, was an important factor. Um, and so looking inside of these programs, what, what was being coded as direct instruction or explicit instruction or intentional teaching is important to talk about. And basically, it's teacher-planned activities and interactions but that are specifically designed to teach information and develop skills. But, it, but it's, not just, it's not just organic, it's not just children setting up a good environment and letting children play in it. There is an intentionality in what the teacher does. Very similar to, the, um, to that inverted pyramid that Jenny showed where there's some basic good practice at the top that everybody needs and then you get more focus depending on the child's needs and, and, and where they are in terms of their learning. So it comes in varieties, and I'm going to get, give you a little demonstration of two kinds of intentional teaching. Um, so you all have to help me here, okay? I actually, for a, a month in my life that felt like um, 20 years, I taught in a direct instruction curriculum for children with disabilities. Um, and um, oh, I need a Pretend I have a, a, a pad in front of me, a little um, placard that has this hamburger on the top and the orange underneath, okay? And you are a group of three and four-year-olds. Don't try me, okay? You're a very well-behaved group of three and four-year-olds. <laughs> uh, and um, the in instructions, I forgot to bring my little prop up here. The instructions are for me to whap the placard as I say, this is a hamburger. What is this? I heard someone say, this is a hamburger. Good job. This is a hamburger. What is this? Oh, you all said the whole sentence. Thank you. This is an orange. What is this? This is a hamburger. What is this? And this is an orange. What is this? Yeah, you can see why I wanted to slit my wrist. Um, <laughs> so what do you think this, this lesson was supposed to be teaching? Most people say, Complete sentences. Now, every lesson was about complete sentences. That was just a side benefit. This was supposed to be the difference between a and and. And and, you know, so that and orange, the a hamburger. I mean, okay, so this is really stupid direct instruction. <laughs> because, first of all, children get that over time. Nobody has to do explicit instruction to teach that to them. And they got so confused because you would do multiple A versus N um, discriminating uh, stimulus and they, they started doing an in front of hamburger and they just got totally confused. So it was, uh, you know, I really hated it. So that's a kind of direct instruction we're, that we're not talking about, okay? Stupid, delivered whole group, but, but, um, but here's a contrasting expli some explicit instruction or, or intentional teaching. Mrs. Blanco's class goes on a field trip to a pet store and down the street, and much to the children's fascination and the teacher's dismay, the owner feeds the snakes live mice. And um, so, of course, back in the classroom where they're interested in following the children's interests, they had planned on doing this whole pet store thing, but oops, <laughs> suddenly you're doing a snake thing <laughs> because snakes were what really got there. And, um, and, and that, in a sense, is the kind of flexibility you want to see in intentional teaching. They didn't give up their idea of, of helping children think about classification within science and think about habitat and think about needs, but they did, and, and describing and predicting and thinking about snakes. Um, or animals in general, but they did give up the idea of necessarily focusing on pets in general because that was not where the children were the most fascinated and where they were going to get the most bang for their intentional teaching. Um, because the, 
specific science content is not what's critically important, it's having content is what's critically important. Um, so back, they're looking at the book Amazing Snakes, the children, a few children are, and um, they're looking at the page on boa constrictors, and so they, they point to it and ask Mrs. Blanco what it's called, and she says, well, that's a boa constrictor. And then because she is an intentional teacher, she's thought about this already and thought about this rare word and this juicy word, constrictor, and she gives some explanation of, of what that means, and she tries to make it something meaningful to the children in terms of like, you know, when, you're, when your mommy, when you hug your mommy and she says, oh, you're hugging me too, you're squeezing me too tight, then that, you know, that's what a constrictor does. Then she has to spear off here and talk about, you know, but when the constrictor does it, they're trying to kill them. <laughs> so there's a little, um, but, but it, it, this, is, this is what's in, interesting to children, and you can bet that with a couple of other um, references to constrictor, they've got that word, you know, and not that that's an essential word, but good, good words is what we are after here. Um, and she also introduces the term prey, um, and, and, and so it, she, she doesn't bother with the boa thing, because that's maybe a little obscure to them. But anyway, you can see that, that what this um, explicit instruction is about. Now, one of the things that this is, a, there's still something missing in this example of expl explicit instruction, and that is that there's no assurance that all the children heard this. So you, if it's a word or a set of words or a concept that you want to make sure all the children know, you've got to be even more intentional to make sure that you that you deliver it um, in in, in small group individual context where all the children hear it, and that's the idea of intentional teaching. And I think anyone who thinks that preschool is just babysitting um, has has not really tried to teach young children because th that takes a lot of hard work. Um, just I mean, just this one little example, you can see that. The other thing that we see across these studies is a, a real, a, a, and across effective programs, is a real understanding of teachers' role in play. Too often what I see, and I see, I go into early education programs all over um, the U.S. And, and abroad, and what I see the most is teachers managing play, and they support children's activities, but they don't use that as an opportunity for value added. They don't understand how to, skillfully scaffold children's thinking processes and their solve, problem solving and, and their implementation of the standards. Um, they particularly don't understand scaffolding children, the sophistication of children's dramatic play. What they tend to do is try to avoid the the Power Rangers play, I don't know if that's popular in Canada, but it's still popular in the United States. So the, the kind of action uh, simplistic kind of associated dramatic play, but not that sophisticated, taking a role, sticking with it for a while, the kind that really builds all kinds of incredible abilities for children, not the least of which, which is self-regulation. Um, and then also intentionally scaffolding social problem solving. When children start having social problems, it's not a matter of solving the problem for the children, it's helping the children figure out the steps towards solving it because that lasts forever as opposed to the solving the problem right now, just make sure that this kid doesn't grab the toy from the other kid, which is not, that, that's, that's an immediate solution, but it doesn't help with the child's learning. Um, so New Jersey's urban pre-K program. We, in New Jersey, um, we, we have an unusual situation where our, our Supreme Court ordered preschool um, in 31 low-income school districts that serve about a quarter of the, of the population of New Jersey. Um, and it's part of a larger school equity funding case that, um, that, that was a K-12 um, case, but preschool got it ordered in it. The, the, um, that what the court ordered was a, a teacher with, with a, I think you call it here a B.Ed., a bachelor's degree, and a four-year college degree with certification specialized in early childhood education and a trained teacher assistant in every classroom. Um, they, Eventually, it became a full day program, a six hour educational day, plus extended day and full year. But the extended day and full year, I know this is, is something y'all are talking about here, the extended day and full year met the fairly high quality childcare standards we have in New Jersey, but not the educational day standards. So at that time, you could have a teacher who, um, a teacher and an assistant um, in the aftercare who, who had training, but not the bachelor's degree. Um, and you could also, rather than the maximum class size of 15 during the six hour day, 
you could go up to 20 in the um, aftercare program. Uh, it was also universal within these low-income school districts. The majority of children are eligible for free and reduced lunch, which in the United States means a, about 180% of the poverty level. Um, but that did mean that mixed in there were other children who were either marginal, you know, just above that, or actually um, quite well off, it, just depending on the neighborhood in those school districts. The court actually ordered um, developmentally appropriate curricula. We added the fact that it needed to be evidence-based, and we, we selected five models that the school district could choose from. They could, they could submit another one for, us, for our approval, but no one ever did. Um, they just chose from among those five. We also developed early learning standards for children and what they we would learn. Those, those, I didn't like the way that early learning standards were being put out just about the child, so we, we had teaching and learning standards. So we had the teaching processes that were most likely to result in these learning um, outcomes. And then we also developed program guidelines. And in all of this, we involved the entire community. Um, there was support specifically funded support for children with learning difficulties beyond the special education funding that was already there, and also professional development across the different staff roles. Um, one of the things that I don't think I have a slide on, but that I think is, it might be of interest to you given the model that you're developing is that two-thirds of the children are served outside of public school buildings. The public school district contracts with child care providers and with Head Start um, and pays them to pr deliver the program at these standards. But the, the Child Care Center and the Head Start agencies must basically do what the district tells them to do. And, the sen and that's, not, I, it, that's not always easy. And there's a lot of, of contentiousness about control um, in, in that set situation. But it's, brought, it's infused a lot of money and a lot of professional development into the broader early care and education arena in New Jersey. Um, and it, it took advantage of expertise that was available in the private provider sector that was not necessarily available in the public schools. So it's been, an, it's been a, as I was saying yesterday, it's been a forced marriage, but I think it's been a pretty successful one in most cases. Um, oh, I'm sorry, it was here. So we, when we say private, by the way, that, that just means that it's not di directly delivered by governmental Body. So school, public schools are governmental bodies, whereas these are, all, while their the funding comes from the government, they're not, um, they can be nonprofit, for profit, faith based, Head Start. Um, let's see, I think I said all of this. And districts are, in, are responsible, and the state holds them responsible for the quality of the program. So we, well, what I thought was important when I took over um, administering this program was to make sure that we were making evidence-based decisions about everything. Um, and so I, 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 we put into practice this continuous improvement cycle. We talked about the standards. We, we developed standards at each level, at the child level, at the classroom level, and at the program level, and at the state level. Um, we then just put in, it's a pretty simple thing, and um, those of you who know high scope know the plan do review process, that's basically what we're talking about here. We, um, we measured and assessed our progress toward the standards. We then looked at that data and said, how are we doing? We planned some interventions, we implemented those interventions, and then we measured again. Um, and, it, and at some point, you gotta kick back up and look at your standards, because at some point you've met them and maybe you can raise them. Um, so as, as I said, we had um, a ca different accountability levels within the continuous improvement cycle, including um, efficiency and fiscal um, management. And just to explain some of the m methods that we use, the preschool teaching and learning expectations are our child outcome standards. This is what we hope children will be able to do as a result of attending the full program at high quality by the time they enter kindergarten. And I, I assume you all know the way we talk about preschool and pre-K is, is before about the age of five. It varies district by district in New Jersey, what age you start kindergarten. Um, and then kindergarten is the year before first grade. It's just a single year in, in most of our states. Um, so the preschool teaching and learning expectations, we developed a performance-based assessment system that teachers um, used to assess children's progress. It's an observation and work sampling based system based on our standards. We also um, took 
we, we developed the preschool program implementation guidelines. These are things like what are the tasks of administration and how should it be carried out? What are the tasks of classroom coaches and how should they carry it out? What are the what should we be doing for dual language learners? What should we be doing for inclusion? Those were the program guided guidelines. And then we developed a method for observing whether districts and their partners were meeting those guidelines. Um, we also did, within the classroom, we conducted classroom structured observations using um, research tools. And we also used some for professional development. And then finally, to meet what the court and the legislature wanted for the state, we developed a, um, a, a, a research design to look at outcomes. And I'm going to be now showing you some of the outcomes of all of that. So one of the tools we used in the classroom was the support for early literacy assessment, which looks at language and literacy. Um, and this is the supports that classroom is providing, the teachers and the environment in the classroom are providing. You can see that as a result I, of the continuous improvement cycle of working on this over a, a, um, a five year period, this was 2003 to 2008, the shift. So the periwinkle color um, to the, the left is, what, is how classrooms scored in 2002, 2003. And it's on a five point scale one being not at all, nothing's happening in regard to language and literacy, and five being pretty unattainable. And you can see these are in, in chunks of one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five. So in the beginning, we were scoring well under a three on average, with a lot of classrooms barely doing anything. Um, and in the last, the last um, uh, publication of the data, you can see that the vast majority of classrooms are uh, above a four, I mean above a three, and that um, we're actually on the high end of that. We're clo you know, closing in on, a f on an average of a four across the state, which is what you would kind of aim for on a in a large scale. So in this, what, children, what children are now receiving in these classrooms is much more likely to be leading to language and literacy results for them, positive language and literacy results. The story in math is a little less, um, uh, less salutary, but still good. Um, you can see how much worse we were doing in terms of supporting children's math learning, but we're still not anywhere near where we'd like to be. One of the problems, of course, is we don't have, the, the, we don't have a lot of good information about exactly what you should see in a three-hour observation to, lead, to expect really good outcomes for children, because this, this, this kind of observation scale has not been used very much. But we're still definitely making progress in terms of offering more math for young children. But this is a statewide, I mean, a nas national issue is that preschool and science are not taught well in, in, um, in, in the preschool years. Math and science are not taught well in the preschool years, or actually in the early grades at all. Um, and then I think probably many of you are familiar with the eckers are the Early Childhood Environment Rating Scale. It's a kind of general look at basic, good, developmentally appropriate practice. But particularly, it looks a lot at, at environments for health and safety, which in the beginning of this program was really important. Remember that we, we were taking in programs that had been very underfunded for years. And now we, we needed to build them up. And, um, but you can see a, a really dramatic shift. I think what's most important to me is how few, now only just slightly over 4% of the classrooms are scoring even below a 4, whereas the majority of classrooms were below a 4 when this started. And on a scale of 1 to 7, below, below a 3, you're actually worried about the, the safety and well-being of children. Um, so we were just marginally above that when we started, and now we're average about a 5.4, which um, is really much much more satisfying and, and we feel good about those results. We still want to get nobody under a four, but that's not too bad, only 4%. And so what does all that mean for children and what they learn? Well, we, um, we found initial gains right off the bat, um, as with most of the studies at kindergarten entry for language literacy and math. Um, we found across the board that two years have basically twice the effect of one, very similar to the Chicago study. Um, at the latest follow-up, which is second grade, we're now looking at the children in fifth grade, but at the latest follow-up in second grade, um, you see effect size is very similar to what Steve presented for Chicago. Um, and now we're looking statewide, and of course it's not a huge system like Chicago, but you know, there's some pretty entrenched issues in some of these urban districts. 
Um, we think that our, this study underestimates effects because we couldn't do a randomized trial in New Jersey because it was a universal program. We had to use the um, regression discontinuity with a, with a um, non-equivalent comparison group to follow the children, and we think this is probably an underestimation rather than the, the, um, we, we actually are having better effects. And I think the big, the big um, story for the policymakers and that helps us um, convince people like our new governor who ran on preschool as babysitting, <laughs> that um, preschool is a good investment. He now does believe it. He's, he's funded it. Um, he's actually added to the funding for preschool two years in a row, which nothing else in the whole budget got added to. Um, anyway, I think that the big take home is that we've cut grade re repetition in half with two years of preschool um, and substantially with only one year of preschool. So that those kind of results are really important and, and meaningful in children's lives. And I think that's what, what is most important about all these numbers. So, um, you know, across the, the um, studies that Steve presented and also um, some of the information I presented, we, um, we can see that preschool programs can have long-term impact. They, um, it works in large scale and in small. It's not just those tiny d boutique studies that are finding these kinds of results. Um, We've got to really look at implementing the program as it was intended, no bait and switch. You can't call it preschool and then offer something that, that's not really educational. Um, there's still a lot we need to know about three to five and even more we need to know about birth to three. Um, and clearly every year matters. <laughs> every year that we wait matters and, um, and, it, and it, it, it does take time so the faster we get it going, it was horrible. Overnight we had to have an, in, uh, we had to be serving, you know, 50,000 children overnight in New Jersey because the court said we did, and, and it was worth it. It was hard, but it was worth it. So, um, I think that's it.